Hello and welcome to the Brighton and Lewis Downs UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, known as the Living Coast. I'm Sarah Dobson and I'm the Biosphere Programme Manager here in Brighton. This morning I'm going to be presenting a short overview of what makes this area special enough to be designated as a World Biosphere Reserve by UNESCO before providing an introduction to the Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project, the subject of our conference this week. To start with, let us go on a quick tour of our Biosphere Reserve through this short film. Planet Earth's great diversity of life thrives only within the thin surface layer called the biosphere. For life to flourish, we need to take care of this living skin of our world. A global network of UNESCO World Biosphere Sites are leading the way as places that balance our daily needs with those of the rest of nature. The Brighton and Lewis Downs Biosphere area spans almost 400 square kilometres of land and sea, from the River Ada in the west to the River Ouse in the east. The countryside here is part of the South Downs National Park, but our biosphere also includes the city of Brighton and Hove and county town of Lewis, as well as the coastline and sea between Shoreham and New Haven. Our biosphere is home to more than a third of a million people and receives 12 million visitors every year. Thousands of species of wildlife live here too, especially on the internationally rare downland and chalk reefs. Our area's development has always been intimately linked to the environment, underpinning the rich heritage and contemporary culture that we enjoy today. A network of green connections reach from Brighton to the surrounding South Downs National Park, out to places like the spectacular Dry Chalk Valley of Devil's Dyke. Colourful and biodiverse chalk grasslands can be found on the steep slopes all along the South Downs Way path, from where there are incredible views. The county town of Lewis nestles within a gap in the downs on the River Ouse, surrounded by chalk downland and floodplain meadows. The Ada River Valley to the west also captures floodwaters before it flows down to the tidal estuary at Shoreham by Sea. Nearby, Shoreham Port is an increasing focus of new development and renewable energy. The port of New Haven on the River Ouse to the east is also an area of seaborne trade and economic regeneration. The striking coastline of white chalk cliffs here is rich in fossils, with the beaches beneath hosting a treasure trove of sea creatures, perfect places for rock pooling. Below the waves, the chalk reef extends out to sea with every available surface covered in life. The undersea world here is so rich that it's now protected as one of the UK's first marine conservation zones, extending westwards as far as Brighton Marina. We all need to value, care for and sustain our world-class environment into the future. Please join us and be part of it. So, I hope that has given you all a bit of a flavour of life here in the Living Coast. As you saw in the film, our biosphere is made up of the three main areas comprising the rural landscape of the South Downs National Park, the urban environments of the city of Brighton and Hove, and surrounding towns and villages, and the local marine environment. Biospheres are primarily a spatial designation, recognising natural sites of international importance. Our biosphere is based on the chalk block of the South Downs, between the River Ada in the west and the River Ouse to the east, north up over the Downs to Ditchling, and stretching two miles offshore to encompass our coast, chalk reef, and the marine conservation zone. The Living Coast covers approximately 390 kilometres square, an area just larger than the nearby Isle of Wight, which has also recently been designated as a UNESCO biosphere. The Living Coast encompasses some really special areas of natural environment, which we call the core areas of the biosphere reserve. These are the areas marked in red on this map. As well as being core areas of the biosphere, they are also designated as sites of special scientific interest here in the UK which means they are areas that are of particular interest to science due to the rare flora or fauna they contain, or important geological or physiological features. All biospheres share the same three global objectives, the conservation of nature and culture, supporting sustainable human development, and shared learning, awareness and engagement. Within our biosphere, we aim to support a thriving world-class environment 
to be enjoyed by all forever. Our mission is to connect people and nature to inspire a positive future today. As you would expect in our biosphere, the special sites are closely linked to the chalk environment. On land, these sites are primarily designated as good examples of what we call chalk downland. Downland can also be termed chalk grassland and, for many months of the year, it can look similar to rough grass pasture. However, visit these sites in the spring and summer and you will be rewarded with the sight of the downland blooming with wildflowers, including rare native orchids and this, the round-headed rampion, which is also known as the pride of Sussex. The species-rich downland is incredibly biodiverse, often with up to 40 different species per square metre. As well as bountiful plant life, the downs are home to rare species of insects that have adapted to live here. Some of our most well-known are the chalk specialist butterflies, such as this beautiful Adonis blue, as well as birds such as skylark and corn bunting. Aside from the important qualities of the habitats and species that find a home in this beautiful landscape, the chalk downs also do an incredibly important job in providing all of the fresh water for the region. The chalk block of our biosphere houses an aquifer, storing groundwater that has filtered through the chalk above over the course of many years, a hugely important natural asset. The chalk cliffs running along our coastline to the east of Brighton Marina are also designated as a geological site of special scientific interest. You can see in this image the banding of the chalk cliffs, which enables geologists to literally look back through time as it provides the best and most extensive exposure of an important chronological fossil site in England. The gentle folding and the ease of access to the cliff exposures make this an especially important collecting site for fossilized animal remains from between 86 million and 72 million years ago. They provide an excellent record of changing sea levels and environmental conditions that occurred during the last few glacial periods that affected this area. Also in this image is the intertidal range of the Chalk Reef, part of the Marine Conservation Zone. Beachy Head West Marine Conservation Zone stretches along the coastline from Brighton Marina, beyond the biosphere boundary to Beachy Head, with a gap at New Haven. It extends half a nautical mile seaward from the mean high water line and covers approximately 24 kilometres squared. One of the main reasons for this site to be designated as a marine conservation zone was the extensive intertidal wave cut chalk platforms and subtidal chalk ridges, which are among the best examples of marine chalk habitat in the southeast of England. Chalk Reef is a fragile and unusual marine habitat which supports abundant wildlife, including threatened species such as blue mussel beds and native oysters. Short snouted seahorses, one of only two seahorse species found in the UK, can be found within the shallow waters of this marine conservation zone during the summer months, and the site acts as an important nursery and spawning ground for the species. However, it's not just about the special areas of our natural environment that makes the living coast so unique, but our cultural heritage too. There is evidence of human settlement on the South Downs going back thousands of years. The earliest evidence of human settlement is found at Whitehawk Neolithic Camp, a sketched reconstruction of which is shown in the top right image. This camp is a Stone Age monument at an over five and a half thousand years old, predates Stonehenge by at least 500 years. Also within the city boundaries is the Iron Age hill fort at Hollingbury, an archive image of which is shown in the lower right hand picture. It is believed that this was the site of a small village as the remains of five roundhouses have been excavated here. The site was occupied again in Roman times. Brighton Museum has recently unveiled a new archaeology gallery as part of its permanent displays. This includes striking reconstructions of the earliest inhabitants of the Living Coast area and encourages us to consider how we might learn from our ancestors how to live again more in harmony with nature. Some of the content in the gallery was developed with support from the Interreg Channel Programme as part of this Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project. In more modern times, the small fishing village of Brighthelmstone had developed into a fashionable seaside resort by the end of the 18th century. 
The Prince Regent, who later became King George IV, was undoubtedly the city's most influential resident, building the Royal Pavilion and inspiring the famous Regency style of architecture that dominates the city's most imposing squares and seafront. Brighton's School of Art was founded in 1859, and the city's reputation as a cultural destination continues to this day, with a thriving arts and music scene drawing creatives and performers here from all over the world. The city hosts the month-long Brighton Festival annually in May. Founded in 1967, it is now the biggest curated cross-arts festival in England. The city is also renowned for its food scene, with a strong focus on local and sustainable produce and is frequently named as the best place for vegetarian and vegan food in the UK. Brighton has also recently achieved gold sustainable food place status, the first city in the UK to achieve this impressive award. To complement the food, there are numerous well-established breweries, drinks producers and award-winning vineyards in the region, some of whom will have the opportunity to hear from directly over the course of this conference. Beyond Brighton, the county town of Lewis also has a rich cultural history, but is particularly well known for its bonfire heritage, sometimes being referred to as the bonfire capital of the world. Equally, the town of Shoreham by Sea in the west of the biosphere has been an important port since the 11th century. Both Lewis and Shoreham have strong independent arts and music traditions, particularly within the folk and sea shanty traditions. We will be able to learn more about the Sussex coast's maritime and folk heritage on Thursday and hear some traditional shanties sung. Alongside our cultural and environmental heritage, a key ingredient in what sets our biosphere region apart is the people that live, work and learn here. Shared learning, environmental awareness and engagement is one of the global objectives of all biospheres and the community is vital in ensuring that the living coast continues to thrive. Community groups, charities, schools, colleges, universities, local organisations and businesses alike can all take an active role in supporting and protecting our natural environment, helping to preserve and enhance our biosphere for generations to come. The Living Coast is proud to be the UK's only urban biosphere. Over a third of a million people call our place home and about 12 million more visit annually sharing in the experience of our unique natural environments and diverse cultural heritage. The Living Coast Partnership brings together more than 40 local bodies, united in our work to connect people and nature to inspire a positive future today. This unique mixture of environmental, cultural, social and economic organisations is a real asset. We are also able to utilise the accolade of the global designation as a biosphere, to add our support to research, funding bids and novel project initiatives. As well as our local partnership, we are also able to utilise the global, European and national networks of biosphere reserves to share learning, experience and best practice through UNESCO's Man in the Biosphere Scientific Programme. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Man in the Biosphere Programme and celebratory events to mark this milestone birthday are being held all over the world. So, as I mentioned before, all global biospheres have three shared objectives. We contribute to these objectives by participating in and delivering projects, such as the Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project. Before I speak more in detail about the Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project, I'm going to introduce a few of the other projects we are delivering here in the Living Coast. A core theme of our project work is to conserve and enhance our natural environment, particularly our heritage chalk downland. We work with our partners, especially land managers, to conserve the areas of good quality chalk downland and restore areas that are not in such good condition to support the resilience of the overall habitat system. As a partnership, we are able to work together to share learning and best practice management techniques to improve habitat quality. We also aim to build better connections with the environmental and cultural heritage of our chalk downland for our urban residents and visitors. For example, we are re recreating areas of downland wildflower planting within the urban environment, enabling residents to engage more closely with the special qualities, habitats and species of the downs in their own spaces. 
This is to encourage a greater awareness and understanding of the value of our heritage downland, both for people and our local biodiversity, and to encourage residents to feel confident to explore and benefit from the open spaces of the downs that are so close to the city. Wildflowers have been being planted in bee and butterfly banks and in roadside verges across the city and towns of the Living Coast for a number of years. Recent surveying of these pollinator friendly planting areas has revealed that they are doing a great job to support our local biodiversity. This shows that creating stepping stones of local native plants and flowers throughout urban environments really helps to support the resilience of our threatened pollinators and is something that urban residents and organisations can contribute to through planting local wildflowers in their own green spaces. Some of our special natural environments are not very accessible to the majority of people, which makes them harder to engage with, appreciate and protect. For example, the chalk reef of our marine conservation zone is largely underwater. In order to overcome this challenge, we worked with a local digital artist who created a virtual reality tour of the marine conservation zone called the Living Coast Undersea Experience. The Living Coast Undersea Experience is an interactive, accessible virtual reality and 360 degree experience, enabling users to explore the underwater environment of the marine conservation zone and its important species of plant and animal life. The virtual reality experience encourages the audience to not only see for the first time and wonder about this amazing and unique habitat, but also think about the species that call this site home and how your behavior at the beach might affect them. For example, you can pick up rocks the marine creature may be living underneath, but as this is their house, you can only put the rock back in the right place, helping to embed the seashore code for when the audience may be able to visit the beach in real life. The experience aims to open up access to our unique marine environment, raise awareness of the marine conservation zone on our doorstep, and be a powerful kinesthetic and educational experience to help people understand the environment and the things we can all do to help conserve it. We also utilize modern technology such as smartphone apps to encourage our local residents, students and visitors to become citizen scientists and get involved with biodiversity recording across the biosphere. Using free apps such as iNaturalist mean that anyone with a smartphone can help us map and monitor different species across the biosphere, but also use the app's instant identification technology to help learn more about the species people are seeing in their local spaces in real time. We participate in the Global City Nature Challenge each year, where cities across the globe encourage their populations to get out and about as citizen scientists and record as many bio biodiversity sightings as possible across one weekend in spring. This friendly global competition is a really fun way to involve anyone and everyone in nature spotting and helps increase knowledge and awareness of our local environment along the way. Last year, over 40,000 people took part in the event globally and we managed to record nearly 600 species here in the Living Coast. Earlier, I mentioned how important our landscape was in protecting our region's supply of fresh water. Since 2012, We've been part of a project called the Aquifer Partnership, which works to improve the resilience and health of the chalk aquifer under the downs, where all of our fresh water comes from. This project aims to tackle the rising trend of nitrates in the groundwater. This problem is not exclusive to Brighton, it's actually a global issue. There are two strands to this project, tackling issues in the rural environment and those related to an urban environment. In the rural environment, the project is testing new approaches to reducing chemical inputs and improving soil health, while maintaining environmental and economic sustainability for land managers. In the urban environment, the focus is on promoting better delivery of solutions to protect groundwater, including sustainable urban drainage or rainscapes, and encouraging best practice in amenity land and industrial site management. Another significant challenge is managing the pollution that gets into the groundwater from surface water that has run off the road. Vehicle use doesn't just cause air pollution. The third highest cause of water pollution in the UK today is from highway runoff. This is because brake pads and tyres wear down, 
chemicals, leak fuel and oil, and this releases heavy metal, hydrocarbons and nitrates onto the surface of the road. It remains there until the next rainfall and is then washed into the drainage system and ultimately ends up in our rivers, streams, groundwater and seas. For example, it has been found that the highest proportion of microplastics in the ocean come from car tyres. A good illustration of this comes when it snows. Snow quickly turns to black mush as it combines with the pollutants that usually lay unseen on the road, as illustrated in the lower left hand image shown here. So, hopefully that has provided some further information on the different types of projects and outcomes the Living Coast Biosphere Partnership work together on achieving. Now, I'm going to introduce in a bit more detail the project that has brought us together for this week's conference, the Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project. The delivery of this project has been possible thanks to funding from the European Regional Development Fund's Interreg France Channel England programme. The Interreg Channel programme aims to fund high quality cooperation projects between France and the UK. The programme was set up to foster economic development in the south of the UK and the north of France by funding innovative projects which have a sustainable cross-border benefit in the programme's eligible regions. The Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project brings together eight project partners delivering outcomes through four biospheres. Alongside the Living Coast here in the south of the UK, the four participating biospheres and North Devon Biosphere in the southwest of the UK the Marais or de Mogois biosphere in northeastern France, and Iroise Islands and Sea biosphere on the northwest coast of France. The biospheres and project partners have worked together to develop and deliver this project because they all can contain internationally important landscapes, habitats, and species, and are popular destinations for tourism, with the visitor economy playing an important role in the local economy. Collectively, they attract over 20 million visitors per year, which can have an impact on the environment. The Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project aims to increase the value of tourism while safeguarding and enhancing the environmental and cultural heritage values of the area. This will be achieved through a strengthened understanding and awareness of the local environmental and cultural heritage that help makes these four biospheres reserves popular dest destinations. This increased knowledge helps site managers and tourism businesses identify opportunities to develop new sustainable tourism products that celebrate the heritage and cultural practices linked to the environment. These tourism products will offer to the visitor the opportunity to discover new places, engage with the local environment and culture, and boost the sustainable economy in each region. The project will enable site managers and tourism development organizations to identify the most appropriate areas to develop new tourism experiences. New activities developed as part of the project will be based around areas of the biospheres that may not currently be the very popular or honeypot sites and have good environmental capacity and resilience to help reduce the impact of visitors to the most sensitive sites. There are three main outputs that we are wishing to achieve as part of the project. One, to conserve and protect the environmental and cultural heritage and natural sites. Two, to work together with our local businesses. And three, to develop new environmentally and culturally based activities. The project is developing a shared approach to better understand and manage the flows of visitors through our biosphere reserves to benefit both the natural environment, local residents and the visitor experience. We are working with our local stakeholders to develop and deliver this approach in practice, supporting businesses to develop their awareness and understanding of the local natural and cultural heritage and increase their business opportunities and resilience. We are also developing common methodologies to deliver the biocultural heritage tourism approach in order that this may be utilized in other areas and destinations. I hope that this has provided an introduction to both the Living Coast Biosphere and the Biocultural Heritage Tourism Project. Over the course of the next three days, we will be discussing different elements of the project in more detail, seeing some examples of the Biocultural Heritage Tourism approach in practice from some key Living Coast stakeholders, and learning more about the important environmental and cultural heritage of our region, 
that sets us apart and helps us achieve our designation as a UNESCO Wild Biosphere Reserve. 